Thank you. Thanks again. And uh, for anybody uh, um, judging uh, um, turnout, I'm, I've started my first day of vacation. So, so that's the shirt sleeves. Um, uh, but happy to be here. Very beautiful sunny afternoon in New York. But I, given that it's all virtual, wherever you are, I hope it's good. Uh, the task I was given was to provide an update on medical therapies, and I took the liberty of, of uh, uh, tweaking the title a little bit, and I'm going to speak a little bit about the impact of GLP-2 therapy um, and, and how that is evolving. Here are my disclosures. Uh, I, I'm, I'm a scientific advisor to multiple companies now in this area. Uh, and, and I have to say, um, both from my perspective as an academic clinician in this area, and perhaps from Oli's perspective, after many, many years, perhaps decades of, of academic and uh, pharmacologic drought and intestinal failure, suddenly we have three, four players um, with interesting drugs and renewed interest in this orphan field. So it's an exciting, uh, it's not never a good time to have uh, intestinal failure or have a family member have intestinal failure. Uh, but for the academics among us, I, I hate to confess, these are interesting times. Okay. Um, uh, I'm going to jump sort of right into it, perhaps that I didn't show you the most important disclosure there, which is the fact that I'm a surgeon, and I've been asked to speak about medical therapies, uh, perhaps I can, I can speak with, with much greater freedom uh, than, than the true medical experts might. On the panel that you're seeing on the slide, if you move from left to right, look at the graphics, at the bottom of the slide first. When you look at the graphics, when you move from left to right, the prognosis worsens. What does that mean? The picture on the extreme left, as you're looking at the slide coming from the top down, you have your esophagus, the gullet, the stomach, the first part of the small bowel, the duodenum that we don't even count, then all of the small bowel uh, and some or all of the colon. So in group three, patients with intestinal failure have lost some bowel, but, but they retain really a substantial amount of small bowel, the first part called the jejunum, some of the second part called the ileum, and some or even all of the third part called the colon. So that's the most favorable group of patients. The most challenging are the ones in group one extreme right in the panel. They have their stomach, the duodenum, they have a small or variable length of jejunum, and that ends in an ostomy. So, so for those of us who are looking after patients with intestinal failure, the patient with what we call a high jejunostomy is often the most challenging. So to really put that in context, if, if I really had my druthers and somebody said, well, uh, we see that you're being lazy, but you have to look after 10 patients with intestinal failure, but we give you the choice that you pick your patients, I would much rather take 10 patients with say 10, 15 centimeters of small bowel, but who are in group three, meaning they have, they have the two different parts of the small bowel, the jejunum and the ileum, they have some colon, versus say, uh, uh, patients with jejunostomies who might have even more bowel, 100 centimeters, 120 centimeters, but ending in a jejunostomy, much more difficult to manage. So that's an important thing to understand. And, and this has actually some implications to, to how medical treatment uh, it can be deployed. Now, I won't dwell on this slide too much, but I do want to emphasize, you've heard multiple talks today from uh, good friends and experts. Uh, this, this, for me, is a particularly uh, important slide. Um, uh, I might be dating myself here, but those of you who are familiar with this type of thing, this was one of the early slides I made in in 1999, did I say I'll date myself? This was made as a glass slide. If you remember those days where you made these things on carousels and projected them, and it's obviously an easy slide, but I transferred it to PowerPoint a little while ago. Um, but the concept has really remained the same. We are 
hoping and increasingly uh, perhaps you're encountering uh, centers such as ours, uh, Dr. Mercer Center in, in Omaha, for example, that build themselves as intestinal rehabilitation centers. And the idea is very simple, that really all of the different therapies you've heard um, in this session and others may be uh, the use of diet that you heard from Maria, um, managing fluid and electrolytes you heard from Dr. Mikulik, um, medical strategies I'm going to speak about, uh, specialized operations that Dr. Mercer spoke about. If you do all those well, then it's only a small percentage of patients who really should need transplant. Now, that is not to say transplants a bad thing as some of you know, I'm a transplant surgeon. I certainly like to do transplants, but to put that in context, we will see about 130, 150 new patients each year. We do all the other things that we do, I think reasonably well, and then we transplant 10 to 12 patients a year, and that's about right. So that green circle is important. My interest is obviously surgery and transplant, but increasingly uh, I'm spending time on the medical strategies. Uh, this is a slide that I adapted from a good friend and a pioneer in the field, Professor Pali Epperson in Denmark. And, and it's a very simple concept that we all know so well, but what I think is, is described well. So go from below up on this slide, on the, on the left side of this slide, you start with, let's say you or a loved one is diagnosed with intestinal failure. You start with simple things, everybody, just everybody benefits from dietary uh, counseling, good dietary management, and, and unfortunately experts like uh, uh, Maria and the people you've heard on this uh, uh, panel are unfortunately uh, relatively few and far between. Uh, everybody wants a magic drug, there isn't a magic drug, but simple measures like oral rehydration solutions, um, uh, just the right amount of salt, very important, tiny amount of sugar, and we can come back to this in the questions because you repeatedly hear that you need to avoid sugars. And yet here I am talking about adding a tiny amount of sugar. There is a reason for that. And then of course, water, original description was boil cool water is the best, possibly the best fluid you can drink if you have short bowel. Then anti-diarrheals to slow down this bowel because what you've lost in length, we want the bowel to increase its function. So simple anti-diarrheals that have been around now for several decades, anti-secretory agents, the stomach puts out a lot of acid and juice, and certainly in the first six months after you lose your bowel, that's even more. And then the current era is the era of intestinal growth factors. And in sort of what we call physiological terms, we see this in parallel. Uh, if, if one were to examine the bowel closely, the lowest, the first phase right after somebody loses their bowel length is what we call spontaneous adaptation. Your body is very clever. The bowel lengthens, it thickens, it becomes wider. That is spontaneous adaptation. What we can do with simple medical uh, measures is conventional pharmacological hyperadaptation. And finally, this is the era of hormonal hyperadaptation, and I'll speak a little more about it. I'm not going to dwell too much on this. This is a slide from Laura Matrice. Uh, until recently, maybe even now, uh, one of your uh, uh, trustees on the Oli Foundation. Very simple do's and don'ts, and people think, oh my God, you're now going to make me eat something really fancy. And the short answer is no. People with intestinal failure need to know two, three things. They need to eat often they need to eat small meals more frequently and there are really very simple don'ts avoid simple sugars avoid uh, soda caffeine avoid plain water and juice and that's really it and the do's just eat healthy so really patients with intestinal failure for the most part should be eating healthy like really most of america should be eating but it's not uh, and we encourage hyperphagia, particularly in adults. That's how the body compensates. And when you give, when you give the bowel more food, it works better. Not much different from going to the gym and gym and perhaps uh, uh, doing some weights so over time. It gets better. The bowel will get better over time. Um, I'm not. I suppose I should spend a little more time on this slide. Simple anti-diarrheals. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time on individual drugs, but the antidiarrheals 
um, uh, can be used to slow down the bowel. There are different classes of them. Some of them certainly have side effects. Some of them have mild narcotic effects. Uh, Lamodal, for example, but these can be very effective, um, used uh, appropriately. Typically, we advise patients to take them 30 minutes before a meal and perhaps lasting at night so that you can try and get a good night's sleep. Uh, I will mention that DTO, tincture of opium, it is effective in addition to the first two, but many insurance companies don't prove it. Um, uh, codeine is an alternative. These are also pain medications. So, so one needs a little uh, prudence in using them. Uh, but we certainly tend to use Imodium and Lamodal in nearly all patients, and we can use them additively. Uh, acid suppression, I mentioned your stomach is working over time in the first six months. Uh, after you've lost a lot of bowel. Uh, and then the medications on the right, we can come back to them in the Q&A session if we have time or there's interest. But these have really only specific indications. Not all patients will benefit, but they may have a role. One drug I will mention, clonidine there is a drug if any of you has encountered uh, with high blood pressure. This is a drug that is used for high blood pressure and has been shown to reduce uh, bowel output, so it can improve diarrhea, it can improve ostomy losses in patients with intestinal failure. So these are common drugs. One thing I will emphasize, we use we use really maximal doses of most of these drugs. We use them long term, and sometimes for our pharmacists, um, I need reassurance that that is okay. Of course, it's okay. Just as patients with intestinal failure are malabsorbing food and drink, they're also malabsorbing medication. Um, uh, Taduglutide, that's a mouthful of a name. Uh, when, when I first encountered the name, I said, can you not make, call it something simpler? And, and unfortunately, there is a pharmacological convention to how these drugs are named. So, so I, you might have heard of Taduglutide, Gatex, and I might use both names. I don't like to use commercial names. It's just easier on the, on the tongue. Um, so Taduglutide or Gatex, it is, it's an analog of a naturally occurring hormone that healthy bowel produces. So I'm going to, I'm going to spend a little time to explain this. When, when a healthy person eats a meal, the last part of the small bowel, the ileum, and the first part of the colon, uh, the large bowel, produces this hormone called GLP-2, glucagon-like peptide 2. Um, and so this is a naturally occurring hormone that appears to help in digestion, most more importantly helps in absorption, and it has some other effects that help in digestion. It increases portal blood flow uh, between the intestine and the liver, and, and it may have some effect in maintaining the lining of the intestine. So, so GLP-2 has some very beneficial effects. The problem is that naturally occurring GLP-2 lasts in the circulation for a very, very short time. Um, uh, what's the movie gone in 60 seconds that did not describe GLP-2, but it could have. Um, so this clever man, Daniel Drucker, really a pioneer in this field. And I had the good fortune to spend uh, uh, a few days with him when we both uh, testified at the FDA um, on behalf of NPS when GLP-2 came for approval. So Dan Drucker has spent now a lifetime looking at these various GI hormones. And, and this is one of only many, many things he has done. And, and I love this picture from one of his original papers that describes the effect of GLP-2 um, today for your for your purpose, GATEX or tenuglutide. And, and what you can see on the right side, the lining of the intestine has these finger-like projections that we call the villi and, and, and routinely we describe it as a way to increase the surface area of the intestine from imagine, imagine you have a table tennis table and if you can, if you can look down with, with, with magnifying glasses on the little felt and the little felt projections of the fingers on the table and if you could go up and down each of those fingers. Imagine that the surface area of this little table tennis table might be the surface area of a tennis court of a, of a 
like a French Open tennis court. And that's really what GLP-2 seems to do most dramatically. On the right side, you can see when, when uh, these animals in the lab were given GLP-2, the height of the villi, these finger-like projections became much greater, the valleys between them, the crypts. And, and, and this is where digestion really happens and absorption happens across this lining is dramatically improved. So this was a dramatic change and, and, and the commercial GLP-2 that is now available to do or Gatex by, by changing, well, I'm going to go back to that very quickly, uh, the second gray um, uh, uh, peptide, it's, it's uh, one amino acid, glycine was changed in the natural molecule and, and suddenly the half-life becomes significantly longer, long enough to be able to give it once a day. I don't want to spend too much time on, on the design of this study, but uh, this was a very, very well conducted study for its time. Uh, um, I think the study ran somewhere between 2008 and 10 or 11, maybe. It was first run in Europe. The, the data was very uh, uh, compelling, but the FDA wanted um, North American patients to be included. And this is sort of the gold standard of how medical trials should be run. This is called a randomized, placebo-controlled, double-blind trial. There's a mouthful. But what it means is essentially on the one side is the drug, on the other side is a placebo. And you can imagine this was not a pill, but this was sort of saline injection with no effect effect really. And, and both the patients who got these medications and the doctors who gave them did not know who was getting what. And there were some fixed rules we had to follow on how we could reduce TPN. So this was a very good study design called the STEPS trial. And, and this was the sort of bottom line um, main result, which is on the left side, the patients who got teduglutide um, really had a good response. Two thirds of the patients, roughly about 63% of them, uh, reduced their TPN, the primary responder rate. And, and, and what was called the endpoint of the study, the main uh, thing that the uh, that the sponsor, the study sponsor had to show to the FDA was that patients who got this drug could reduce their TPN by 20%. What's magical about 20%? Really nothing, except that when we were discussing study design with the FDA at the time, the FDA accepted that there were many adult patients who could manage with TPN five days a week. And so one night off was 20%. And, and and those of you who are familiar with this and deal with this day in and day out will know getting one night off is, um, um, I, I will quote myself and cause some laughter and fortunately did not uh, hurt the approval. Somebody at the FDA actually asked me what is so special about getting one night off. And I said, I don't know. What do you do on your nights off? Um, go away, play bingo, go out with the kids, whatever it is that you do. So one night off TPN is definitely a good night. And that's what uh, two thirds of patients who got this drug uh, benefited from. And th there's more to come. There was even greater benefit. Some patients can decrease their TPN even more. And I'm gonna to speak to that in a second, but I wanna spend a minute uh, looking at that gray bar. Look at what happened in the placebo arm, 30%, one third of patients who just got saline injection also reduced their TPN. What does this mean? Does this mean this was hogwash? Actually, it was not. And this is why trials have to be done well. And this was one such. And I'm, I'm going to spend just a minute on it. Now there have been a lot of papers written about it. And, and what more have we learned from these observations? There's a lot to learn from a study that was done in 2012 and reported in 2012. We're still learning from that. But, but look at the right side. The dark blue bar is, is uh, uh, the actual reduction in TPN. And that looks significant, certainly in the, in the, med, uh, in the drug arm, the tadoglutide arm. And, and it looks significant in the placebo arm as well. Uh, but see how the effect was obtained in the placebo arm. When we were all in the study, because we're all blind to what, what, we're, what the patients are getting, what we're giving them, what we're doing, we were allowed to stay within the confines of the study. There were strict rules. How much could you allow people to drink? How much could you reduce? How much urine output could you accept? 
And in the placebo arm, you, what, you, what turned out on further analysis was the patients dramatically increased their oral intake. They were paying closer attention, perhaps. The patients were paying closer attention. The doctors were paying closer attention. They increased their oral intake. And we had to keep the urine output. You just heard from Dr. Mikulik about how we like to keep the urine output above a certain level each day. But there was a certain minimum in the study. And in the placebo arm, the patients coasted very close to the minimum. So this is not a false finding, it's, but it's, it's real that the placebo group, yes, did benefit, but seemingly not from the injection. They benefited perhaps by the close supervision within the study and by increasing their oral intake and by accepting a lower urine output. I'm not gonna spend more time on this slide. We could do a whole hour of discussion just on this slide. There's a lot of new data about this slide. Okay. Uh, very quickly, the side effects, I want to keep a watch on my time. I, I do have a um, tendency to talk a little bit um, uh, or more than a little bit, perhaps, as my friends would say. But, but here are the common side effects. And I really, I, we can talk more about this. But the bottom line was most of the side effects were predictable from the known effects of the drug. Um, there was some abdominal discomfort patients who had stomas. Actually, we had a couple of patients in the study who called us frantically a couple of days after they started the injections and said, oh my God, what's happening? My stoma has become a lot bigger. And, and we didn't know better at the time. We just thought that was okay. We know what the drug does. And we reassured them and said, that's okay. Maybe it's a sign that the drug's working. As you can see from the rest, uh, the rest of the side effects, they were all reported, had to be reported to the FDA, are all relatively common in patients with intestinal failure who have central lines and there was nothing special uh, in the patients who got the medication. But there were three very important and quite uh, concerning side effects in the study that was reported to the FDA. 43 patients got the drug, 43 patients got placebo or saline, and there were three cancers reported in the, in the um, treatment arm in the patients who got gadgets and we looked at these closely we had to we had to report them to the fda very closely and they're worthy of greater attention and and uh, let me take the two lower cancers first they were both lung cancers and and both happened in a single eastern european center both patients were heavy smokers and uh, and they really uh, in looking into this in greater detail there's not much evidence that tetraglutide even acts on lung cancer so these were dismissed and the fda accepted that these were possibly not even related to the medication. The first one caused a lot of concern. This was a GI cancer. It was a cancer that was metastatic. It went from the bowel to the liver. And, and, but when you look at this patient a little closer, um, what you find is this was a patient who had had a previous cancer, a low-grade cancer, a, a lymphoma called Hodgkin's lymphoma, had received radiation, had received chemotherapy years prior to coming into this trial. And, and unfortunately also had a liver lesion on a CT scan that was done before the trial was started. So it was unclear whether the drug caused this cancer or was there a cancer that the drug caused to grow more. But clearly this will cost some alarm and, and led to several of the recommendations that the FDA uh, mandated and that are now common practice that we need to make sure that there's nothing going on in the bowel, we need a colonoscopy, etc. So my own assessment of this is that uh, certainly patients with active cancer should not get the drug, patients who have polyps should not get the drug, and, and we, it behooves us before we use this medication, I think it's a very efficacious medication in, in experienced hands, it's a relatively safe medication, but behooves us to be quite careful before we start prescribing it, it's not just one more antidiarrheal. We just recently concluded a study that was published uh, just last year, a really doing a deep dive. Dr. Ulrich Pape from Germany uh, led this effort. And um, uh, we looked at all patients who had received tetraglutide in several trials, both in the US and in Europe. This was, this was a 
monstrous amount of work <laughs> to do this, um, only to say, well, we don't know very much. Not that we don't know very much, we know quite a lot. And, and actually it, it, this particular study was more reassuring than anything else. And the most important I will say to you is literally the first line on the left. There were a lot of stoma complications reported. Most frequently, the stoma became bigger, it swelled up, it, the appliance didn't fit. And, and that's, I, I will say, I, look, no side effect is desirable, but if you have to have a side effect, that's a desirable side effect because it suggests that, um, that the drug might be working. I wanna to move to the extreme right peripheral edema, where your feet get puffy, your ankles get puffy, that may also be a good sign, but it also reflects that in some cases, when the drug starts to work, you need to pull back the TPN very quickly or patients can get fluid overloaded. But otherwise, there were no safety signals that caused alarm from this really uh, very detailed study. Um, this is a very, very important slide, and I'm going to walk you through this carefully. I hope you can see it. And I, I just want to acknowledge uh, my good friend, Francisca Jolie, who runs the program in Paris and who's done a lot of work in this area. And she got the slide in their presentation to the European Medicines Agency. And this really follows uh, for the most part, how we use this medication. So start with uh, what is the drug used for? It is indicated for the treatment of adult patients with short bowel syndrome, but not simply because you had short bowel syndrome, you should have short bowel syndrome with intestinal failure, meaning you also need TPN or IV fluids. It could be just IV fluids and the drug is appropriate for that. Uh, and And just as it was in the study, we recommend that patients should be stable following a period of intestinal adaptation after surgery, so patients are well away from their surgery. Um, treatment should not be initiated until the patient is stable from other things. Have we optimized the diet to have they listen to Maria's recommendations? Has Dr. Mikulik optimized the fluid intake? Um, is Dr. Mercer done with the surgery? And um, once the IV fluids don't, you know, we don't like to do too much chopping and changing, make sure you've, you've brought the TPN and the IV fluids uh, to a steady state where you've come down as much as possible. Sometimes patients need a little more. And then once that's optimized, make sure there are no risk factors that tell you this patient should not get this medication. I spoke about this earlier. There should not be active malignancy, no cancer, no recent cancer beyond five years is our thumb rule right now. And, and, and you should look for colon polyps, deal with them. And if, if there is no malignancy, no reason this patient cannot get the drug, then the patient is possibly a good candidate for tetraglutide. And beyond that, certainly, uh, you really need to weigh the risk and benefit carefully and decide what's the benefit for the individual patient. Um, uh, can I just get a little time check? Because I know I started late, you were running late, but uh, I have about 10 minutes more. Should I be speeding up? Uh, you think about that. Hello, Joan. Oh. <laughs> I'm the police. <laughs> I, I thought I hadn't heard from you in a while. Um, <laughs> no, but so I'm going to run through the rest. There's, there's some interesting stuff, but we can talk about it even in the question answers. Look, so it's all very well that GATX uh, reduces TPN needs in some patients. Uh, that's great. But to me, the holy grail of intestinal failure management that's the jackpot is if we can get patients off TPN. So, so some years back, we looked at uh, all of the, uh, we did what's called a post hoc analysis, five different trials. We pulled all the data to see what happened. Did the patients come off TPN? How many patients came off and what did they look like? And, and that's number one. So about just so maybe about 11, 12% of patients came off. I can tell you since then with continued treatment, more patients have come off and that number is now about 22 patients have come off. So it tells you that, that patients can come off over 
over time with continued treatment. And, and we observed that most patients who came off TPN appeared to have um, uh, some colon, and that seemed to be important. The uh, number two shown there is our initial report from our own center. I acquired lamb and nutritionist who worked with me, looked at this data and reported it. We treated uh, 18 patients and 16 of them responded, made some decreases in their TPN. 11 of the patients, that's a good number. 11 of the 18 patients came off TPN and 10 of the 11 had some colon. There's a much larger study reported just now recently from uh, Francisca Jolie in Paris, as I said, this was a French national cohort study. There are just over 50 patients. And in that, co in that study, about a quarter came off TPN. And the important thing was most patients who came off TPN required less TPN to start with. And most of them had their colon, uh, had some colon left behind. Just in the interest of time, I'm going to run through this. It's a bit of a complicated table. But this was an important paper that Dr. Jefferson recently wrote uh, three years ago now in gastroenterology. And what he showed was when you look at this group one, the patients, if you remember earlier, I said the worst group with the high stoma, these patients are difficult to manage. They, they actually got the greatest benefit, percentage change. So many of them will go from say four liters of TPN a day down to two liters or two and a half liters a day. Significant volume decrease, but less likely to come off TPN. The patients who had some colon remaining did not change their TPN volume all that much, but many of them got days off TPN. And this is an area that, that we've developed the interest in now. We're looking at this closer and closer because we think that, that this now begins to tell us that all these years we've been treating patients with short bowel as though it's one big basket and, the, and patients are all the same. Of course, no two patients are the same patients are have individual problems, need to be treated in an individualized fashion. But we're seeing two big groups. The patients who have some colon behave differently than patients who have stoma. Uh, I'm not going to dwell on this. This is the paper rate and we can talk more if there's time. But, but uh, as I said, in our experience, most patients who came off TPN uh, really had some colon remaining. We are very aggressive. If patients have a little bit of colon, we will do, even if that's high-risk surgery, we'll put them back together. And now there is a more compelling argument to do that because don't view surgery as an end in itself. Can you combine surgery with then later using GLP-2 to help some patients come off TPN? Similar experience from France. Uh, we've talked about this, um, and I'm not going to dwell on it. I, I, I mentioned this. This is a very interesting study um, from a good friend of mine, Gabriel Gondolisi, and his group in Argentina. Um, oh, I beg your pardon. I'm, I'm one slide ahead. I, Joan scared me into hurrying. This is the pediatric data. Um, I, I have only one slide on the pediatrics. There's really not a lot of experience yet in pediatrics, but I will say that the trial data suggests that kids on TPN with intestinal failure can get similar benefit to TPN reduction as the adults did. Obviously, we're a little more careful in the kids to use a drug that is known to be a growth factor. That's not meant to be alarmist. Keep in mind, this is a natural hormone that the bowel uh, produces. Um, but this is what I wanted to tell you, that the two papers from, from um, um, Gabriel Gondolisi and Hector Solar, Hector is his medical counterpart. Uh, they've both written papers right now on this. And this, I thought, was a very, very interesting study. What they actually did was they, uh, they operated on these patients to the extent possible, wherever possible, they operated. If there was a little bit of colon, they put it together. So tried to make group one into a more favorable group. And then uh, they did their best uh, to try and reduce TPN. I'm sorry if this panel is small, but it's important. After surgery, they did diet, medical treatment, did their best to reduce TPN, and they made some progress. And after six months, when patients were stuck, 
they added GLP-2 to these patients and look what happened. Over time, there was continued benefit and it just brings me back to, to what I think should be the mantra that, that no treatment for these patients should be viewed in isolation, but rather be put back together. So this is really, I think, I think this, this is a, a great report and, and, and bottom line is when we use these different therapies in tandem and look at all of them, increasingly perhaps uh, people like me need to look at not just medicine, not just surgery, but, but sort of like, a, like the foreman at the Jiffy Lube, you drive your car in, it's the foreman who says, oh yep, you need a little oil here, you need a spark plug changed or whatever. I, we need to recast ourselves as, as a foreman in a jiffy loop. So this is the current state of the art. Um, on the left side, what I call the severe phenotype, difficult patient to manage, high output stoma, they often need large volumes of TPN, the urine output is low uh, when these patients come in, even when they're doing well, these patients are at high risk for dehydration. With GATEX, they respond well, they actually, really have the best response, meaning they decrease their TPN volume, but they're less likely to wean off TPN. Note I said less likely, some of those patients will come off if we keep working. And on the right side, some colon present, even if the bowel length is short, this is milder. They often have two to three stools per day. We think these patients probably need some energy. That's what they're getting from the TPN. They're slow to respond. Their total response to this drug is um, modest, but they're more likely to wean off. I'm actually going to stop there. I had a, I had a single patient story, but in the interest of time, uh, and just to help you catch up, perhaps I'm going to stop. I know that uh, Andrea had asked me if I would talk about lift echo. I could talk about that till the cows come home. So hopefully we'll have some time for questions and maybe a chat, uh, minute or two about lift echo.